Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Berkeley Center uh, confronting the church's sexual abuse scandal and crisis. It's a great honor for me to welcome you on behalf of all the uh, colleagues here at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. My name is Father Jared McGlone. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Berkeley Center, uh, focusing on these areas of uh, sexual abuse and scandal within the church. We have a stunning uh, panel for us tonight uh, that I'd like to briefly introduce and just let you know uh, who they are. The, the vision behind this panel uh, really started uh, because of my uh, deep admiration for Francesco and knowing that he had just come from a meeting of the National Review Board uh, and uh, in our drive back from Baltimore, we shared lots of different insights that hopefully we can discuss today. Uh, also, uh, the timing of this was really about his availability since he's the president of Assumption College, and I did, uh, didn't want to add more to his schedule. We have dear friends and colleagues, uh, Catherine Marshall here, who um, is uh, just, I think, one of the uh, most important scholars we have here at uh, the Berkeley Center has worked with the World Bank, has really uh, focused in on uh, gender issues and and really development issues and how to uh, solve many of the uh, ails of society in our world you know, through uh, developmental issues. Recently hosted a major conference here on the AIDS and HIV uh, epidemic. Kathleen Coogan is uh, what I think one of the, the, the true heroes of uh, the work that we see needed to be done in the parishes. She is a parishioner at uh, Holy Trinity and has really spearheaded this year of discernment or the processes of discernment that she'll, she'll really talk about. Uh, very experienced uh, person, many different credentials and working with the State Department and uh, many different sort of opportunities to really be an advocate for those uh, who are survivors and victims of violence. And last but not least, a dear friend and colleague, co-author, Dr. Len Sperry, who comes with us, Dr. Sperry and Dr. Uh, Cesario, uh, Cesario uh, is, are, are the various chairs of the uh, boards. Uh, the National Advisory Council is for CMSM, the Conference of Major Spears of Men, and the National Review Board is uh, the same sort of lay uh, external board that deals with the U.S. Uh, CCB and, and, and the bishops. So to have those different sort of perspectives is just a great honor and privilege to have you all here. But also Dr. Sperry is a noted international scholar in areas of outcome research, uh, but also spirituality and uh, has various degrees uh, that are incredibly uh, combined to really give uh, a whole different perspective for us here, uh, Professor uh, down in uh, Florida and also with the Wisconsin Medical School. So, uh, great welcome to each of you. Uh, I'd like to start with you, uh, Francesco, if you wouldn't mind, and to sort of give us, you know, your perspective as someone who's walked with the bishops now. You'll be ending your term as, uh, as chair of the National Review Board in June. So you have a wisdom that I, we want to tap before that tenure ends and just you know, how, how do you see a path forward? What do you see uh, that you you think would be important for us to know tonight? Thank you, Father Jerry. Thank you for the invitation. Thank all of you for being here this evening. So I, I think that we have to look at this issue from both a micro level and a macro level. And on the micro level, the church has done a great deal to address this situation, uh, particularly once the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People was passed in 2002. And so there are many, many protocols and procedures and policies that are in place that uh, you will find across every diocese in the United States. You know, starting with victim assistance coordinators, safe environment coordinators, background checks. I mean, if you, the data uh, for that in terms of the numbers are, two million adults have undergone safe environment training across the United States. Four million children have undergone safe environment training across the United States. 98% uh, of the clergy uh, have undergone safe environment training. So the, the church has responded on a micro level uh, very concretely to the situation since that 2002. That doesn't mean that the charter is perfect, 
there's still a great deal of ambiguity within the charter. Uh, the charter um, it, it does need to be re-examined and reassessed. But on a micro level, there's been a response. So in 2018, the summer of 2018, when we have this second eruption, is what really gets to the macro level, I believe. Because the crisis of 2018 uh, was not simply about the uh, uh, abuse of minors by clergy. I mean, that was not a, that was not a new story. Uh, we have understood this for decades. Uh, we've also seen, if, if, if you look at the data, that the peak of abuse was occurred between 1974 and 1982. And so most of the uh, reports that have come out since then fall within that time frame. So that if you, if you follow the chart, if you, if you look at the John Jay study and the recent study by John Jay that has taken into account what's happened between 2002 and 2019, that chart has not changed. In other words, the, the peak continues to be 1974 to 1982. And the incidence of abuse of minors by uh, currently continues to be very, very minimal. Uh, which is indicative of this, the micro-level response. So the macro-level was really the, 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 um, the explosion, if you will, of the summer of 2018 that signified uh, a um, failure of leadership, that signified that there is a culture uh, within the church, particularly a culture within the leadership of the church, that was concerned much more with the institution and much more with self-preservation than with the child himself or herself, than with the victim himself or herself. And so that is the, that's the issue that we as a National Review Board are really focusing on now. How do we get to a change of culture? And the only way we're going to get to a change of culture, and we talk about transparency and accountability, is through a meaningful a meaningful involvement of the laity in this uh, resolution of this problem. And that meaningful response has to be seen as one of co-responsibility. I think that's very, very important. It is not the laity taking this on, on their own, but it is the laity working together with the bishops, the clergy, et cetera having a co-responsibility for the life of the church in dealing with this question in trying to lead a meaningful reform. Uh, and so we can very easily point to, you know, we, we hear a lot about clericalism was the cause of this. Well, is it really the cause of this? Uh, it's certainly symptomatic, uh, but we can't just say this was the cause of it. Uh, and we have to be careful because if, if we say, well, the whole resolution of this will be having a lady resolve this issue. You could have a clerical forum of, among the laity as well. There could be a clericalism of the laity. So that's why I like to speak about a co-responsibility that all of us together understand that we have a real responsibility to address this issue together. And so I think there are many, you know, we'll talk about some of the other uh, ways in which this can happen moving, f in moving forward in this conversation. But I just wanted to give that as sort of the foundational landscape. Thank you, Francesco. Appreciate that. I'd like to now ask Catherine uh, Marshall to sort of also give her perspective in this. And one of the um, uh, the areas that you and I have talked about personally and also uh, professionally is the centrality of putting survivors and victims first. One of the research projects that I have in mind here, and one of the uh, recommendations from uh, John Carr and, and Kim Daniels is to when we have a re an approach that's survivor focused, that's victim focused, then we can begin to repair some of the moral injury and, and the moral uh, sort of uh, abomination that has occurred here. Uh, would you like to speak to that and would you like to sort of give that perspective as to you know, what do you see from the outside? Now we've seen from the inside. What do you see from the outside? My perspective is largely outside the Catholic Church uh, in a very multicultural institution, which is the World Bank, 
many different nationalities and cultures. Uh, and three, three points, I think, relate very much to the problem we're dealing with. The first is the transformation of the culture overall that we have lived through. And I lived through it very personally and very directly from being almost always the first woman doing whatever I was doing in an institution that was all men and watching it transformed into an institution where there still are plenty of problems, but where there are women at different levels. Uh, but the, uh, so the, the, so that's the first issue is, and, and we hear that all the time, standards were different then. It was, it was a different world. And yet, it's a world that seems to have changed far less than we think. So the second point was being someone who was at the receiving end. I think we're all very uncomfortable with the word victim. Um, but object is not very good. And survivor begs the question of the degree of survival. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the, the basic problem is that there is a no-win situation for someone who is in this. And it was something that happened not every day, but at least every week. And things that you would not believe uh, were, were things that happened. Um, and they did leave scars. That um, And most of the things one, one never talked about, ever, though there was at least some sort of amused battle stories of, did you, I mean, <laughs> just to give you one, that there was um, a vice president who was having an affair with someone that was very well known, and every time he got on the phone at a time where there were networks of phones, all of the secretaries would give a nod and pick up the phone simultaneously. <laughs> so you see that the, there was a sense of humor, but the, basically, it was a complete no-win situation to come forward because people would not believe you. And then the third thing is I was a manager, an early manager, and I did take from that experience that I had had that if someone working for me faced problems, I was, by God, I was going to go after it and, and do something about it. But one of the, it was this complexity of the, of the situations that one had to deal with, that went from raw, just sheer insensitivity to not picking up signals to people who were real predators. But the almost universal response of the leadership was, in the first instance, he could not have done that. He's a good person. I know him. He's honorable. He could not have done that. And then when it was proved beyond doubt, well, you know, it didn't really hurt her. Um, she must have asked for it. It's a temporary aberration. Um, let's just make it go away. And only with the most extreme situations were they willing to look at it and still whoever was the victim was questioned and looked at with great suspicion. And sadly, I think we're not very far away from that situation still. So finding ways to, to support um, people being more honest in their recognition and helping people to understand how common these kinds of situations are. I think your comments, thank you. Uh, I think your comments and Francesco, your comments really signal to me a thread that I don't think we've really seen um, more beautifully articulated is the, the cross systemic nature of this, the societal nature of this. I think the ways in which a path forward, I'm interpreting what you're saying, Francesco, is, is the sense of you know how do we take responsibility and how are we allowed to take responsibility is another question. Um, and what I'm hearing from you also, Catherine, is, is something that is near and dear to me as a survivor of abuse, as uh, one who has spoken of this publicly. One of the most difficult uh, realities for me was being believed, you know, for that very reason. 
oh, well, this person would never have done that. What do you mean? How could you possibly um, accuse father of this? And it's like, no, father did this, and father did this often. Um, and so isn't it interesting that, that that sort of toxicity, that same sort of denial, uh, that seems part of the systems uh, analysis to me, that, that seems very much about putting a woman in a very one-down position, putting children in a one-down position, but also the, the systemic denial and cover-up, I think, is something that, that strikes me. Just one other comment is that I think it, it also highlights how complex people are, yes. that people can yes. be wonderful people who do wonderful things but have a dark side. Absolutely. And we saw that all the time. Exactly. And we're seeing that with many of uh, the bishops and the cardinals who have failed now in this latest uh, reiteration of the scandal. That without question, you know, Cardinal McCarrick did wonderful things, but, you know, but he's also done horrendous uh, crimes and committed uh, horrible uh, offenses against against God in the heavens, I mean, quite frankly. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, one of the things that I think the, the McCarrick situation highlights and something that uh, certainly you've talked about extensively, uh, Dr. Sperry, is, is the ways in which, um, whether religious system, the major superiors of men, or the diocese, there seems to be certain clear patterns here, and I think that's what Catherine is also identifying with organizations. And I'd like to see what your first perspective is on this and what you'd like us to sort of uh, concentrate on with from your perspective, which is really uh, full of both social analysis but theological analysis with your uh, degrees and, and just also a man of great faith. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to start by talking of the. We can't hear you. Yeah, that's on. I need to go to the volume. Then we need to put it up top. Yeah. yeah. I want to start by saying that language is important. And in this venue, technical language is talking about the crisis is absolutely critical. It's not optional. So too many well-meaning discussions use non-technical language and often confuse causal uh, uh, factors with, with symptoms with the root problem. So for example, loss of members, decreased attendance, contributions, decreased contributions, they're symptoms. Some causal factors, clericalism, secrecy, cover-ups, lack of transparency, faulty theology of priesthood, and li limited involvement of laity in, uh, dis in discussions and decisions are held out as uh, causes of the crisis. They are not, I agree with Francisco, they are not causes. They are causal factors, but they are not root causes. Again, the technical meaning of terms is important here. To the extent to which they're not using, the conversation becomes obfuscated. And there is not a possibility of coming to some common sense about what the root cause of the problem is and what are the pathways to a true reform, which is going to be the solution to them. From a technical uh, perspective, the organizational psychology perspective, the basic problem and the root cause of the crisis is systemic. Now, I can't tell you what the root cause is because we just don't know. What's unfortunate is the rest of the leadership of the church doesn't seem to, at this point in time, be uh, uh, supportive of finding out what that root cause is. But I do know this, as in all the consultation I've done and all my leadership training and teaching doctoral seminars, um, that the root cause is always going to involve the six subsystems of an organization, and when and if we determine 
uh, that root cause, it's not going to be just one of those six subsystems. It's probably going to be uh, many of them, perhaps even all of them. But we don't know at this time. And anyone who takes the position that they know what the real problem is, is uh, someone that uh, I'm, I'd be a little wary of. Now, I'd like to also suggest that um, as a, a clinical researcher and consultant, um, and, and I was trained in, in graduate school in outcomes research, and the motto of outcomes research is, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. You can't, if you don't measure it, you can't predict it. If you don't measure it, you can't uh, hope to reform a, a system. A, a follow-up is that organizations that measure and monitor these outcomes, they become smarter. Organizations that don't become dumber. And there's actual data on this. If you are not making decisions based on data, your curve doesn't keep going like this when you make decisions. It actually levels out and starts going down over time. That's a given indicator. In a, a given. Uh, at this point in time, uh, the Catholic Church has some data, but not necessarily the right data. We've got data on lagging indicators, which, and, and uh, uh, Francesco gave you an example in his opening remarks of those. We've got that lagging, those lagging indicators. You know, all the people that have been trained. Unfortunately, leading indicators are going to be the ones that are going to be useful because you can plan interventions. You can plan uh, solution-focused efforts to change around those, but you can't around uh, uh, lagging indicators, which are just outcomes. They're not process indicators, un unfortunately. I'd like to add one other piece before I uh, 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 turn it over, and that is the concept of moral injury, which relatively recent in our, uh, our consciousness. And it's, it's come to us largely because, <coughs> pardon me, of returning service personnel from the Afghan war. Now, this phenomenon, moral injury is one that has uh, some similarities to PTSD. So we think, oh, well, all what people are experiencing over, over in Afghanistan is PTSD. Well, actually, it may be also, or instead, may be the, uh, the symptomatic of moral injury. Now, uh, here's one definition. Moral injury is the biological, psychological, social, and spiritual impact of acts, any acts, that transgress deeply held moral beliefs, convictions, and expectations. Now, uh, at this point, church leaders have yet to accept this notion, and rather they prefer psychological or medical explanations. And that uh, is unfortunate because by not recognizing the moral dimension to the crisis, they have not had really any uh, deep motivation to do what needs to be done, the reparation that need, needs to be done that they can do, not that some therapist um, or some support group is going to provide, because therapy isn't sufficient. In fact, it, at this point in time, doesn't seem to have much to do with moral injury. Now, we know more from the military, even about sexual uh, 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 abuse, sexual misconduct as a moral uh, injury among the military. We know almost nothing about what it means in 
in any uh, uh, Christian denomination. Although, uh, interestingly, uh, a couple of Christian denominations are, are, are moving forward on their understanding of moral injury and its impact. I'll just say this, with, with the number of, uh, increasing number of suicides among military personnel after they come back, and it doesn't happen usually in the first couple weeks or even the first couple months. Those are being linked more to moral injury, the fact that, that uh, soldiers are being asked to participate in uh, uh, actions with uh, non-military combatants Civilians, for example, in, in, in these various uh, uh, countries in which they're in, or in actual uh, combat with other uh, uh, you know, enemy forces that go against their very moral core. So we know that the rate of suicide is going up. We're still waiting now to see how much of this is more than just PTSD because of it in and of itself, PTSD has a, a, a relatively small suicide rate associated with, but moral injury, it looks like is uh, quite different and it is maybe behind many more of these suicides. I'm thinking that until we can say that moral injury is definitely not a major part of the sex abuse crisis in the church, then uh, that will be fine. However, I, I will be, as a researcher, be very surprised if we find out that it has no bearing at all. Thank you, Dr. Sperry. And, and I think a clarification is, you know, we certainly have single episode trauma, PTSD. We have complex trauma, obviously several traumas uh, that people experience uh, at once and then uh, perhaps simultaneously. But then what you're throwing into our discussion, I think, is a profoundly uh, important distinction in what moral injury is, which gets at you know, that betrayal of core values, that betrayal of their conscience, that the organization is soliciting and leaders are, are, are really um, sort of provoking. Is that what I'm understanding in this regard? If, if I may. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, one of the distinguishing characteristics between uh, PTSD and moral injury is that moral injury, the basic uh, uh, problem or issue is trust, a lack of trust. And when we're talking about uh, uh, the, cler the clergy sexual abuse crisis, we're talking about a specific kind of trust, which is called the sacred trust. Wow. And that is different. The core issue in PTSD is the feeling that the individual is not safe anymore, not that, they know that they've lost trust and they don't know who they can trust. Can they even trust their own memory anymore? Can they even trust uh, their close family members? But certainly, can they trust uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their church leaders? Well, thank you. And I think this uh, sort of segues immediately into, Kathleen, your expertise and I think your experiences of really what that's been like to, to really have a sort of systemic uh, failure of trust. And, and what that's been like on the, on, the, on the ground level of really seeing and hearing the pain of so many individuals who feel so betrayed and bewildered in this time. Do you want to sort of tell us about your experience of, of where we are and where, how we can go forward? Thanks, Father Jerry. And um, thanks also for the very kind introduction. Um, just to mention that I'm here in my uh, personal capacity and on uh, behalf of a process that we've undertaken at Holy Trinity, uh, where I'm a member of the parish council. And I'm really heartened to see so many of my colleagues 
in the room uh, and on other parishioners from uh, from Holy Trinity and um, and other uh, organizations that are working on this issue. So um, yes, so to follow up, um, we know uh, from uh, Pew research that a quarter of Catholics in the U.S. have uh, said that they have scaled back their mass attendance and donations in response to reports of um, sexual abuse and misconduct in the church. And so uh, we're here today because we know that the church needs to change in order to thrive. And at, the, at Holy Trinity, we asked uh, ourselves a question um, just over a year ago as we were thinking about our way forward. Um, and we ended up um, entering into a process that we call our season of discernment. So uh, as part of this process, we asked ourselves, how could a local parish help to heal wounds, including wounds of trust born of the scandal for survivors and for their families and for the broader church. Uh, many of us uh, who were born into this church uh, and taught to love it. So we also uh, asked ourselves, how can we prevent ourselves from getting stuck in the status quo? How can we um, make meaningful changes uh, that will hopefully lead to uh, meaningful reforms? So um, as, as part of our process, um, we actually were fortunate because America Magazine uh, uh, published an article about our process. And uh, the title that they gave the piece was how, uh, how Catholics in Washington, DC are uh, leading a response to the abuse crisis. And uh, what we were actually leading was a process within our own parish. And the key question, I think, for that title was how. What we ended up talking about was not what our outcomes and objectives were, but rather um, the key attributes of our, uh, of our process that was designed to be inclusive and to be rooted in our um, um, Ignatian spirituality and Jesuit identity at Holy Trinity, and that was also a dynamic enough process that uh, it could help uh, parishioners move uh, from um, expressing their um, th their thoughts and emotions as a result of uh, the revelations last year to um, to action. So uh, a key milestone in this process for us actually was a meeting that took place last week at Holy Trinity because we were very fortunate that uh, Archbishop Gregory came and uh, said mass uh, for us. And before mass, a few of us um, who are leaders in the parish had the opportunity to meet very briefly with uh, Archbishop Gregory. and. This was um, a very hopeful moment for us. We had, uh, at that point, been engaged in our season of discernment. Um, I'm looking at Mary Pat from Voice of the Faithful. I know that uh, I think it was eight days after uh, the, um, the Pennsylvania report was released, uh, Voice of the Faithful met with uh, leaders of our parish and uh, talked about um, starting a process uh, through listening circles, et cetera. And so our meeting um, last week with the Archbishop was actually about a year into our process. And um, you know, at that point was sort of the culmination of our season of discernment. And I thought it was very hopeful because we had the opportunity to make certain recommendations to the Archbishop and uh, and he, uh, responded by listening very intently. And I felt very heartened uh, that as we spoke and, and expressed our, our concerns and our, our recommendations that um, I felt like uh, the Archbishop was looking me in the eye and, and nodding and I really felt heard as a result of that meeting. And so uh, I thought this was a very hopeful moment. I felt like um, a door had been opened to uh, hopefully future conversations about uh, a way forward. Um, and uh, it, you know, it, it reminded me that the, the reach of 
of the scandal, of course, is very broad. Uh, but one of the keys for us is going to be, in, in, in moving forward, is going to be collaboration. And I think this is a theme that um, has resonated already among our panelists. Um, and by collaboration, uh, coming from the parish and the parish council at a local church, for um, on one level, we're, we're talking about collaboration among parishes and parishioners with local universities to um, have the opportunity to speak um, and to listen to um, experts at the universities and, and have the opportunity to make use of space at, uh, at universities. And so uh, collaboration among various stakeholders uh, and, and uh, also collaboration among us and, uh, and church leadership. So, uh, so I think that um, as we think of our way forward, um, this will be, continue to um, be key for us at Holy Trinity. And uh, we're definitely invited to be, uh, delighted to be included today. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And, and just, uh, just a, a shout out to Holy Trinity and to all the parishioners here and to all those uh, who are leaders in this already, the voice of the faithful among them. But um, one of the things that just is striking and, and the similarity of what everyone is saying is, is how this has to be a ha all hands on deck and that we can't exclude any more in the university the voice of uh, the uh, the parishioner and likewise we have to be attentive to that and I think the theme of, of co-responsibility is what you know certainly the, the church uses but uh, I think it's profoundly important the other aspect of the research that we hope to do here at the Berkeley Center is precisely to broaden you know the, the notion of who have been secondary survivors of trauma and certainly non-offending clergy certainly parishioners uh, who are in the pew, who have, have really been traumatized so often and uh, with such, in, in many cases, neglect, uh, where cer certain parishes will not even talk about it, and other parishes are leading the way. And I think for us to be able to do a, a to really look at what, what's this doing to your faith? How can we really be supportive of you is, is, is also part of uh, research that, that we can have going forward. One of the uh, questions I'd like to now move to is what, what do you see as the, your way past the scandal? We've talked about how you see what's going on, what you've done so far, but what concrete ways um, can we begin to imagine and dream uh, moving past the scandal? One of the participants here who's in the audience has, has led the way here at Georgetown, and I want to give a shout out and gratitude uh, not only to you, John, for your friendship and your colleagueship, but uh, I'd like to really acknowledge the example of John Carr and Kim Daniels, who have just been amazing in what they've done in eight different gatherings at the university. And, and then uh, also this report uh, that was released and that we can certainly send you as participants. Uh, if you don't have this copy of this report, it is vitally important to give some sort of context for what we can do going forward. But the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, led by John Carr, who's here, and Kim Daniels, I really want to acknowledge. And so if you wouldn't mind uh, applauding with me his great efforts. And, and if... And if you want to, uh, <laughs> you want something to read tonight, before you go to bed, uh, <laughs> uh, it's on the website for uh, the initiative. Uh, so again, lay voices, uh, that's the purpose of this gathering, is to really uh, gather lay voices, empower lay voices from uh, uh, those in positions of, of responsibility, but also those who exercise enormous responsibility in the in the day-to-day -day living of a parish. So uh, I might start again with you, Francesco, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, what's a way forward in this? What do you see as concrete uh, realities that you would encourage us to, to really focus in upon? I'd like to pick up on uh, what Len was talking about because I think that's one of the ways. Um, and we can take our cue from um, high reliability organizations outside the church. So the military, for example, or hospitals. You have all these protocols in place. 
you know, you go to the hospital and you have surgery and the patient dies anyway, right? All the protocols were followed. The doctors and the nurses did what they needed to do, but the patient died. And so what happens immediately? Immediately, there is an, an, an analysis of the root cause, what went wrong, even though we have all of these protocols and procedures in place. How do we translate that into the culture of the church so that we are not being reactive, but we're being proactive? We need to try to understand what the root cause was of the situation the church finds itself in. And there are currently, as a matter of fact, there are, this is being run through the National Review Board. There is a um, high reliability um, pilot program that the NRB is running where there are 12 uh, pilot dioceses whose bishops have voluntarily uh, agreed to be pilot sites for transforming the culture of their diocese by trying to understand the root cause and then what needs to be put in place to prevent this from happening in the future. So I think that's one very concrete way. Because it's gotta be a change of culture. And I think that's the most difficult thing. That's the macro level piece I was referring to before. We have to try to understand the ethos of leadership in the church. That is not going to be easy to change going to be a difficult thing to change. But until we get the ethos of leadership, what I was speaking about previously, uh, is, is going to be that much more difficult. So I think the root cause analysis, high reliability organizations, and trying to get at the ethos of leadership. That's a very powerful word, ethos, meaning the ethical, moral nature of what has gone wrong. I want to echo back to what you were saying, Len, and Francesco, to, to really look at this, if we look at it from the viewpoint of a moral abomination, then that sort of unites those on the left and the right. If we, if we see it from a moral perspective, not from an ideological perspective, I think that might be a path forward for us to begin to look at the root cause analysis. The, of course, the presumption in HROs is having uh, a, a, a safety culture in place that's willing to really appeal to experts on the outside. And a true root cause analysis would have to do that. In other words, that what so many people have asked for in the, the motu proprio that, you know, that they would have a, a, at least de demanded that the, uh, the metropolitan uh, have to have outside consultants. And still, they haven't ceded authority in that regard, which to me is also systemic. It's canonical and its root cause. And so for us to begin to use those analyses really would be, would be important. Catherine, you've had enormous experience in really changing culture and, and uh, pointing to a pathway forward. From your uh, uh, expertise, what do you see as sort of the hallmarks of how does culture change and, how, and what would you recommend? Uh, a situation where culture sometimes does change remarkably fast. Uh, we, we've seen that in this country. But I, I want to come to two issues that haven't really been highlighted here that to me are, are very critical. A lot of the, this is about respect and about human relationships. And unless there is an acknowledgement of these issues of respect of women, Mm -hmm. and women and men's roles. I mean, we're dealing with a lot of nonsense, this nonsense that you can't be in a room uh, with a man and a woman. I mean, it, it, or you can't have lunch. Right. Uh, we won't say who that is with. with. <laughs> but unless there is an, a coming to terms with the, um, the need, the changing more, more is in our society. Mm -hmm. And the equality of men and women, that is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And being able to to deal with sexuality, mm -hmm. which is a complex, very, very complex issue. Um, clearly, that is a part of the root causes, I would, I would guarantee. But the, the point that I do want to emphasize here in terms of looking ahead is this no-win situation mm -hmm. for the people who are affected, the, the victims, the survivors. 
Um, I know of one case right now where there are four people who finally have with great courage agreed to come forward in a case, but there are 30 people who are affected, which means that 26 have said that it, it's a no-win situation. Uh, they will be destroyed uh, by this. So finding ways to overcome that, I think, is a major, major part of the, of the challenge. And leadership, courage, compassion, all of those are part of it. Uh, but you have to realize that this is a no-win situation for those who are affected. They're always, always the loser, and we see that all the time. That's fascinating that you keep coming back to this issue of uh, sexuality in our own conversations, but also in an initiative we're hoping to really broaden here at the university and begin discussions on how do we begin to have a discussion that really uh, provides the best of science regards to gender and, and roles and, and sexuality and have our moral theologians be at the same table with that evidence and to really engage in something practical that looks at the analysis of how is our views of sexuality, how has our view, let's talk about a root cause analysis, how has the, the, the experience and view of celibacy and sexuality been a, been a absolute uh, important component to the cause of where we are now. And I think that initiative uh, really has to be encouraged and really has to be at the forefront of this because everybody talks about the celibacy issue. Everybody points different figures. No one's talking about, no, it's not necessarily celibacy or married clergy or non-married clergy because we have studies in Australia that say abuse exists throughout any faith community pretty much the same rate. So if that's not the issue, then I do think we need to have a better informed sexuality and theology of, of, of sexuality, which begs the question of a good moral response. So maybe, once again, we're pinpointing the, the sort of lacuna, as we say in theology, the gap that exists with a healthy sexuality, healthy anthropology, healthy belief system that doesn't seem to have been existing and might be one of the, the, the sort of pathways that we look at pointing to uh, uh, a solution in this regard. Dr. Sperry, you've often written about this and, and you, you have some strong opinions about this. Would you like to sort of talk about what do you see as paths forward in, in our understanding? Yes, I would be pleased to uh, pick up on, on, the, on the point you're just making, Father Jerry. And that is on the topic of this technical term called well-being. And well-being in priest is something we, I think, should strive for. And that means not just their physical health, but their moral, their spiritual, their psychological health. It means their intellectual uh, well-being also. And part of that is going to be, uh, is going to reflect a, a, a healthy theology of the priesthood. It will reflect a healthy theology of sexuality. And a healthy uh, a theology of of spiritual well-being. We, I don't think we have reached the, the point of this yet. I do want to uh, mention uh, some other indicators of uh, progress along the way. And the first one is that there are, uh, there are some lay leaders in the church today that have made significant contributions and one of them happens to be in this room right now, our colleague the other end. Uh, in the years, Francesca has been a, uh, of the chair of the National Review Committee. He has effectively and consistently maintained a respect among uh, the bishops in the uh, Catholic uh, conference in this country, but he's been able to speak truth to, to, 
<coughs> pardon me, to power consistently. And I, I just find it remarkable that you've been able to uh, be that instrument of change and effectively. Now, that doesn't mean that they've done everything <laughs> that you've asked. Uh, in his own shop, the, uh, there is a, a leader within the uh, Child and Youth Protection uh, Committee, and Bernie Najadera, he is the one who's spearheading these highly reliability organization experiments in 12 dioceses now. And I believe they're going on, what, third year now? And it's, uh, it's really quite uh, uh, hopeful that this is happening because this is a counter trend to what's happening in, in too many other places where their basic goal is to protect the institution and to protect uh, that particular diocese. So it's, I mean, it, to me, it's nothing short of miraculous that this has happened. And, and there haven't been defectors. You've been able to stay with those 12. It's amazing. There are, uh, there are three other experiments I want to mention. I, I don't have to say too much more about what Kathleen has said, but uh, from what I understand, this is a, 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 a brilliant example of what can, ha can, <coughs> pardon me, can happen at the local level, and that is this experiment of these listening groups that, that I have the pastor involved. It's not just a, a small group of individuals, my understanding, and that have a, uh, an agenda that may not connect up with, with the parishes. It, my understanding is it does connect up the parishes, and it's wonderful to hear that the archbishop has uh, uh, apparently giving your, given him his support. Now, I want to mention two other experiments and both of these involve uh, the Jesuit community. And in, uh, among all religious orders of males in, in this country, the, the Jesuits are leading uh, 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 the front. I'll start with uh, the recent uh, pronouncement of the Superior General who has made it a, and it's a priority for developing safety cultures on Catholic university campuses, starting with the Jesuit universities, an important experiment. And the one that's been going now for uh, uh, some time, and I've had some firsthand experience with it, is the care communities, these are usually inpatient units that the Jesuit order in this country runs. So with, with, with uh, ill or impaired uh, Jesuit members are assigned to this, this uh, health care. And the thing that's so remarkable about them is that the culture and structure and the leadership of, that, uh, of, of these care units is such that members, they become residents of, of these communities, actually are healthier psychologically, spiritually, and physically, more so than they were before uh, they entered the community, this, this new healthcare community that they're in. And I'm quite familiar with the one that was set up at, at the uh, uh, hospital at which I was on the board of, um, of directors on in, in Wisconsin. And now they have a total building. Before it was one floor, then it became two floors of the older hospital. Now it's a complete building, and it's full. They, they can't take any more people. So that is quite remarkable. There's an experiment in how safety 
and well-being come together and make a difference in the lives of people. One thing we know from the safety research is that when an organization has increased the engagement of the majority of its members, guess what? They not only have few or no incidents, sexual or criminal or otherwise, they just don't. The more engaged uh, uh, individual members of an organization are, the, the, the better the whole organization becomes. And I'm going to uh, hope that one of the things that comes out of this conference is that there is going to be formal data that will routinely take care at the various uh, health care uh, uh, programs that the Jesuits have throughout the United States because they can be uh, a marker of what community life could be like, not just in, in a health care setting for the retired, the um, uh, the sick and the otherwise impaired uh, uh, community members, but they can be for every possible uh, uh, ministry. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Sperry. I think it points to not only the well-being that we would hope for in, in diocesan and uh, religious life, but I think what it points to is the contagion effect of what well-being does that if uh, you know, the, the religious communities, if the diocese are exhibiting those behaviors of well-being, then it trickles down and up. And I think that's the image, too, that certain changes, you know, a hope going forward, have to come from above. But the other change comes from below. And Kathleen, I want to see what your opinion is about what do you see as concrete sort of strategies as to what, what would that look like you know, coming from the pews. Thanks. Uh, so we've had a number of um, uh, sort of emerging outcomes from our process at Holy Trinity as a result of the listening sessions. We also hosted uh, several fora during which participants could come together and talk about strategies for increasing inclusion and transparency and accountability um, at our own parish and uh, and and beyond at at the. Uh, diocesan and, and global uh, church levels as well. Um, I, I will say that um, it's not an easy topic to discuss. So our, um, our work in this area, to be honest, is quite tiring. Um, and I think that I've heard that from um, many uh, leaders of other parishes as well. And so this is... Um, one of the reasons that um, I'm grateful to, to Len for um, mentioning that this is a model that's hopeful and, um, and one of the areas where we have um, been fortunate was that we've been able to start to develop these networks of other parishes that uh, have, um, that are uh, undertaking similar processes and doing similar work and so I think um, strengthening these networks is, um, is something that Holy Trinity has been um, starting to uh, work on some to try to increase our linkages with other parishes doing similar work, as well as, as we uh, discussed briefly earlier, uh, working with universities. And um, this is... I think a growing trend that parishes are working with universities. Um, mentioned earlier a few of the reasons that it's a good idea. Um, John has included Holy Trinity as well in, in some of the great work that Father Jerry mentioned that he's been doing. And um, I think that this gives us a way to amplify each other's voices and to uh, provide information on good practices. Um, as we participate in events like this, we can uh, help to articulate our recommendations on um, areas of possible reform in terms of practices and, and, um, and structures. So I think that um, this type of experience in partnering um, helps us to develop a more nuanced 
way forward. And, uh, and even as we've been discussing tonight, uh, helping to uh, help us think about, for example, um, organi organizational change uh, within the, the broader church. So um, I think that continuing to uh, bring these themes back to the parishes and um, hopefully continuing to have uh, parish leaders involved in fora like this could uh, be useful. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And I think what I'm uh, seeing as a, as a common theme here that, uh, Len, you were talking about and also uh, what you were uh, being complimentary to Francesco is about how important it is for the lady to find their voice and uh, to, uh, to realize that uh, if there is going to be cultural change, it really has to be a both end. It has to come from the bottom up, it has to come from the top down. And what I'm also uh, seeing is that the need for us to, to really come back to a new, perhaps, theology of sexuality, theology of safety and safeguarding. You know, what would that look like? Um, how, how, what would that look like across faiths? You know, across institutions? What would that look like in regards to what Arturo Sosa has very clearly said and given as a real preference for the university is how do we create that culture of safeguarding? You know, what, how is that imbued in every aspect of, of our existence as a Jesuit institution of higher learning, as a Jesuit institution of pastoral response? And so I think that really uh, is, is just seems to be a wonderful unifying thread in this. Our, our final sort of um, question in that are, then is really what are the strategies then for having some hope? You talked about the, the way this, this crisis can, can really fatigue individuals and, and also take away hope. And I think that's also, if I remember correctly, uh, one of the aspects of moral injury is a sense of hopelessness, a sense of powerlessness, a sense of mistrust and a sense of shame. And, uh, and that's very different than a survivor of trauma. This hits at a core sort of sense of who we are in our own being. And, I, and that's what I'm hearing in this. But Francesco, what sort of strategies do you have for regaining hope? Uh, I think a couple of things. Number one is, is to really um, rely on the expertise of laity um, you know, to, to collaborate with the leadership. You know, the bishops don't have the expertise, in you know, the psychological uh, background, the, uh, all of the uh, disciplinary backgrounds to be able to look at the complexity of this issue. And so you really need to engage and bring into the conversation the experts. The bishops are the experts in theology, okay? But they're not the experts in the psychosexual social aspects here. And that, people that, are responding to how that expertise well. gets expressed. <laughs> yeah. But of course, you didn't hear me say that <laughs> while being recorded. So, so I think it was the audience giggling exactly. about that. But go ahead. So I think that that's an important piece. Um, you know, I think another piece we haven't touched on, but I, I think uh, going forward is we really have to look at uh, seminary formation because we have to look at the future uh, clergy and how are we preparing and how are we forming those future men who are going to be the leaders in our church, whether on the parish level or in the hierarchical level, because they're dealing with a situation that is very different from the past. You know, just in terms of the stressors that they face being isolated in single man parishes two or three years after ordination. You know, and so the, the importance of the formation of the future clergy is something that has to be taken into account as a way address this issue going forward. And, and don't you think that would be concomitant with an analysis of root cause analysis? Absolutely would how be. How seminaries absolutely. played exactly. a role in this. As Len indicated, the root cause analysis is not going to just fo you know, focus on one thing. It's going to be multidimensional. Uh, and that's going to be one of the pieces of it. You know, and finally, something that has not been done yet. We have not looked at this from a theological perspective. There is not a theological context. Uh, and we really have to develop a theology to try to understand what has happened and then how do we move forward. 
think that came out in a recent theological studies, if I'm not mistaken, by Massimo uh, Fagioli from Villanova, in which he, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you read the article and I read the article, and it really castigated most theologians for dropping the ball on this, that you know, where's our Christology, where's our ecclesiology, where's our morality that has really fed this crisis and this scandal. And I think it's it very, very valid and important ways for us to, to ramp it up on all levels. And so if we're talking about a root cause analysis, aren't we talking about bringing so many expertise to, so many experts to the table to really add that voice is what I'm, what I'm hearing in that regard. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Catherine, uh, talk to me about uh, what, how you see mechanisms for and strategies for regaining hope. Well, the, I think the question is how this very specific set of crises that relate to the Catholic Church in all of its complexity are part of the broader mm -hmm. social changes facing. And I see it very much as part of the broader issue and i think Talk it's about that. it's healthier to see that that we as a society have been through enormous transformations in the in my professional lifetime uh, and we're still grappling with some of the questions of how to run organizations without some of the fixed rules that people thought they had in the past so one of the complexities which you and I have talked about is that there are so many gradations of issues that you don't want to get into a situation where you stifle spontaneity and joy and caring and in relationships. And I do see a very clear change um, range that goes from just plain insensitivity all the way to the kind of predation that is so frightening and that we don't understand either. But uh, I think having that, that sense of humanity and a sense of, um, even a sense of humor at some of the issues, but also an, an appreciation that not every single mistake is a fatal sin. Uh, and, and I think that a lot of, of organizations are coming to terms with that. But it is, I, th I, I, I do want to echo the point that you've made several times and that I think really is critical, that without leadership, you're in, in a real bind. You need to have the leadership. Uh, you do need to have this basic understanding of respect and equality. But you also do need to find ways to hear more the voices of the people who are living in this situation, uh, for better and for worse. Thank you. That it just reminds me so much of of this uh, the the important ways of understanding and engaging with culture in a way that's helpful. I, when you were speaking, I was thinking of so many priests I've walked with who are afraid of the pastoral landscape, who are, are afraid of pastoral involvement because of the possibilities of, of what might happen. And unfortunately, in the Catholic Church, it is one strike, you're done. I mean, you make a mistake uh, pastorally, and uh, whether with an adult, certainly with a child, that, that should be the case. But you, 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 you get into these, this, this fear environment and the culture of fear versus a culture of trust and a culture of safety. And I think that, to me, Dr. Sperry, is, is how do we go forward with regaining hope? How do we sort of uh, move out of the fear, the paralysis, the, the, the complacency that we, we will see naturally seeping in and, and actually have some concrete steps of hope? And you want me to do this in 30 seconds or less? <laughs> Uh, just as a, a short, because we are going to be opening up the, the yeah. session now in, in a couple minutes uh, for questions, but uh, perhaps you can, you can, you have a minute instead of uh, 30 seconds. No. Okay. All right. Well, I, I want to pick up on the theme that, that of, of fear and fatigue that were mentioned. And uh, I can, I have more direct connection in terms of an inside sense for uh, major superiors and 
this is not an easy time for many of them. I, I won't say any of them, but for, for many of them. This is, so what I think characterizes their day-to-day -day experience is both fear and fatigue. A fear that they can make uh, additional mistakes by disclosing too much information. Uh, a fear that something's going to happen for disclosures they may not have made. Fear for not taking uh, uh, some directions and perhaps moving toward this collaborative sense we've been talking about. But the fatigue side is, is palpable. I know that on uh, the, the diocesan and the bishop side, they talk about a certain kind of fatigue that's called charter fatigue. It's you've got all these demands placed on you to be accountable. On the religious side, it's called standards fatigue. And that has unfortunately become a justification for inaction. Um, so moving forward, the, the counters for both fear and fatigue, I believe, are going to be hope and spiritual courage. And those are not going to manifest themselves miraculously, I don't suspect. Uh, they're going to, uh, to come about uh, through some other mechanisms. And I agree with, with uh, Francesco. Uh, the level of expertise needed to address this problem, the crisis, is, does not appear to exist within the Episcopacy already or within uh, uh, the major superiors. Um, outside expertise is, is needed. And to the extent to which there's, oh, there's receptivity and openness to it, I think we can move uh, uh, forward. Uh, Father Jerry mentioned uh, engagement. Engagement, I believe, is going to be uh, the leading indicator that will uh, uh, allow us to anticipate and direct uh, uh, a change and reform. Uh, I'll mention this. Within the corporate world, and I'm, I'm, I watch this, these, these leading indicators weekly, uh, there have been changes since two years ago when the level of engagement of employees in all uh, uh, levels of, uh, of uh, the workplace, so that's for-profit, non-profits, professional organizations, uh, has increased now to 34%. It was in the middle 20s. It's kind of stuck there, then went up to 29. Now it's 34%. That means that you have 66%, if I did the math right, of, of workers who are still either disengaged or who, in a passive way or in an active way, that they sabotage uh, what's going on in that organization. But that uh, compares to the rest of the world, because the data sets on, in, on engagement research, which is the number one priority in all, in all the organizational uh, uh, and management literature today. That's only 15%. So we're, we're twice as engaged as any other place. Now, the other main statistic is that 70% of what accounts for employee engagement is because of the efforts of the manager or the leader. And to the extent that that's 60% or 50% or 40%, guess what? The overall uh, level of engagement in the rest of, in the whole organization just keeps slipping. So uh, we don't have data, and this is why I'm saying we need it in the church today. There is some data on engagement in the parishes, and it, the latest I'm aware of is from 2012. 
7% of parishioners are engaged in their parish. And the two markers for that are donations, making, you know, that these, this group of people gives 80% of all donations to the, the parish. And it's 7%, well, it's 6.9 or so for volunteerism. So there is a very small percentage. Now, the hopeful sign is that if you can increase uh, uh, parishioner involvement by 1% or 2% every year or so, you're going to be in a position where you have engaged employees, and, and those organizations tend to be very safe organizations. Uh, in the five levels of, 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 of measures of safety, they're the most engaged places have no sexual problems. They have no criminal behavior. They have the majority of their people do not lead uh, double lives. Those three things are main issues within the Catholic Church. So I'm just Excellent. hoping that we, we, have a, we have a place to make a clear marker uh, of, of change, and that is to focus on engagement. And that's exactly what <coughs> pardon me, parishes like yours are doing. They're engaging uh, um, the, the laity, and that makes a difference. Critically important. And moving right to that, and so what are your strategies for hope? And you get a little more than a minute then, since Dr. Sperry took a little more than a minute. So we have to give fair time. <laughs> <laughs> you gave a New York minute. And please get your questions ready. And Ruth, if you could just collect some of the, if you would raise your hands with your index uh, uh, cards with a question on it, and Ruth will be able to collect that, and then we will honor that. So please, Kathleen. Thanks. I'll just, um, I guess, mention that uh, we draw hope from uh, some of the experiences that we had with uh, church leadership. Um, so uh, I guess to the extent that we can um, hopefully uh, continue to open pathways with uh, leaders of the institutional church, um, I think this would be very hopeful. Of course, there's plenty of church leaders uh, who don't recognize the magnitude of the crisis. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we had a very hopeful meeting with our um, new archbishop. And um, in uh, the event that I mentioned earlier that we, um, through which Holy Trinity collaborated with um, John's Institute uh, for Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, uh, we were able to uh, hear from Father Hans Zollner, who uh, came from uh, the Child Protection Center at the Pontifical uh, Gregorian University in Rome. And he, um, his remarks provided um, a lot of hope for us that he was very, uh, of course, uh, knowledgeable about the magnitude of the crisis and the centrality of uh, the lay response and the necessity for um, lay response. So um, with that, i happy to turn it over because we're looking forward to your questions. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much. And now we'll try to uh, answer as many questions as we can. Obviously, you can see we're struggling with the microphones here, so I'd like to uh, give this to our panels. Um, what indications have you seen that the hierarchy at large is willing to be collaborative with the laity to share the power? Francesco. <laughs> um. Well, I think you have to take it on the uh, level of individual bishops. There are some individual bishops who are, are really leading the way uh, in engaging the laity within their dioceses. You know, I think what's really been interesting, um, you know, last year the bishops were, all ready, were ready to vote on a whole series of, of new protocols and then they were not able to because of Rome's intervention. But what happened after that were individual bishops began to say, well, I can do that in my diocese without having a, you know, the permission of Rome to do this. And so there are some individual bishops who are beginning within their own dioceses to have meaningful engagement of the lay within their diocese to deal with some of these issues. And so 
um, and when I would say it's these newer bishops, um, the younger bishops who uh, are really going to make a difference in the way in which the engagement of the laity will become more um, normative than not. We have several uh, questions for you. Uh, any, anybody else want to respond to that? Um, I, I fully agree. I think you have to go with the willing uh, because you're always going to get those who see this as an issue that we've solved uh, and that we need, need to move on. So I think that is really important. One of the questions is, could you speak a bit more, and I think both Dr. Sperry and uh, Francesca, you might want to sort of just briefly describe what does an HRO look like and you know, what, do, what would that pilot look like? If you could just fill in a little bit more. of We're talking about HRO. We're, again, we're talking about a highly reliable organization. Um, that's what it's called. And so what might, what might that look like? So, so the whole goal is to create a, a culture um, of reliability when it comes to safety. And that's really the goal. Uh, and in a high reliable organization, what happens is that there is an, always an analysis of root cause when something goes wrong. And then learning from the mistakes that were made or what went wrong, and then to rectify that so that you have um, integrated into your, the culture of your organization uh, a way that is responsive and will prevent that situation from occurring again. So uh, that's in a very nutshell, but you know, Dr. Sperry, maybe you have more experience in actually working in high reliability settings that you might be able to respond to that. I'll do is just mention one of the uh, uh, factors of it. There's five key principles of organizations that are highly reliable. Uh, in our community in South Florida, uh, the majority of organizations that are even attempting to go the direction of high reliability are medical centers, academic medical centers, first of all. And the fifth principle is to defer decision making and ex to the person with the most expertise. And that is a, a break-even point for an organization to say, well, it isn't the senior manager that is, is going to give uh, uh, the input and the order about what to change, but it'll be the person who has the most immediate experience and expertise who may be three or four levels down from that individual who will make a, a, a decision in a crisis situation or one that's potentially could be a crisis. And that, of course, is a, is a stumbling block to uh, uh, leadership. And in the church, it means bishops who say, hey, I'm not going to cede my authority and that's what's so remarkable about the fact that, and so hopeful, that we have 12 dioceses where the bishops have, in those dioceses, have bought into that fifth principle, which is relinquishing expertise, deferring their expertise to, to the person that may be uh, considerably below them and maybe not even the uh, a, a cleric, maybe a layperson, and that's really quite remarkable. And maybe we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I love this uh, comment. Welcome to the 21st century leadership, power sharing, transparency, communication. P.S. Is it not, is it not a sexuality problem or a power problem? <laughs> that's why I figured that was going to I think that the, um, the point that a lot of the abuse that concerns us most is about uh, imbalances of power and misuse of power. Uh, but I do want to, uh, you've heard me say this, but the, I think that there are different levels and different patterns that we're worried about. Uh, and unless we understand the complexity of the way that people and institutions work, we can't 
figure out what the root causes are and get at solutions. And in these, I, I make a distinction between people that I would call more or less clueless, that really just don't really understand that they're having a negative impact on someone. Um, and then people who are, I would call them jerks, in a, uh, some, who, 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 do, who don't pick up um, the, the signals that are being given to them who repeatedly. And then you have the, the creeps, who are people who are deliberately quid pro quo. Have we ever heard that term? Uh, who are using their power in a negative way. So I, I don't think you can say it's not about sexuality, because that's clearly a big part of what we're talking about specifically here. Abuse is much broader, because it goes into all kinds of power relationships. Whether you listen to someone is a part of abuse. Um, um, mental, physical, you know, insulting people is abuse. Uh, but it is the sexuality dimension that I think is a, is a particularly insidious, harmful, and, and difficult piece of, of the broader problem. Well said. Well said. Now do you understand why Ka 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 Catherine and I are dear friends already? Uh, Dr. Spurg, would you like to respond to that at all? Kathleen, any response to that? One of the things I think that I'd like to respond to in, in that is the, the importance of understanding the complexity of what we're dealing with here. If you en engage in a root cause analysis, you really look are looking at the beliefs and the morality, and you are looking at what membership is about. You are looking at leadership styles, and you are looking at the ways in which seminary formation has indicated this, and you are looking at the belief systems and theology that have created this problem, that need you know, really sustained attention uh, and has to be more scientifically informed. But the other issue, and this comes out in uh, one of the other questions, is how do you keep this issue alive when so many say, uh, you know, like they'll quote your data, saying, well, see, it was really those years, and we're not dealing with it now anymore, and we've done with it, we're done with it. Let's move on. How do you respond to those individuals in a, in a way to address sort of the fatigue issue? Well, even though the, the peak was in the past, uh, and even though the incidences have significantly dropped, there are still incidences of current minors being abused in the church. Uh, and so the, the biggest danger is the complacency Right. that can set in, and um, it has to remain at the forefront constantly uh, for the leadership of the church. It is not, it's not something that is in the past. It's not a historical event. Uh, it is still a lived reality within the church, uh, and so that's why the, um, the response that the church needs to make has to be constantly at the forefront, and the bishops have to keep this at top of mind in the midst of all their other responsibilities. And we have to realize that as well. You know, the responsibilities of a bishop are, uh, you know, uh, m m there's so many responsibilities, but this has to always be at the top of their agenda, because if it's not, that's when the problems set in. Well, and if it's not a core value, and it's part of your mission, this is how we become complacent, and this is how we will repeat this. Dr. Sperry, a quick comment on that? Uh, sure. At, uh, at, at, at this point in time, with, uh, with the data we have, it doesn't, it, it doesn't appear that uh, that statement is accurate. In other words, it, the, the, there are still incidents reported. One of the things that we know is that in the first five years after ordination, there are uh, the most likely points of, uh, of, of abuse. But it ne doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, the, that, it's, uh, <clears throat> that we could just, we need to just look at clergy issues. We're talking about a church that has uh, other age groups in it. We have data that shows uh, consistently that 50% of uh, priests are sexually active, usually with adults. Uh, that 
is a safety issue. That's a power issue. Hmm. The other factor that I, I don't think we can uh, dismiss is the fact that insurance companies have underwriting departments that do risk analysis. And one of the things that, that uh, the Father Jerry and I were just really surprised at to see uh, is, is recently the report that two-thirds of all claims for sexual abuse with kids happen in the bathrooms of Catholic schools, ca uh, Catholic camps, other Christian schools, other Christian camps. And that means that there are other perpetrators hmm. besides priests who are involved. So the crisis is has focused very narrowly on priest misbehavior and misconduct. There, there are other kinds of issues. I, in my time on the review board in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, the majority of our, our uh, uh, incidents that were, were uh, the, the Archbishop was trying to decide whether to continue someone in, in ministry with their, you know, with their uh, faculties, were with adult sexual misconduct. Hmm. We, I'd say we had one out of five was, was kids. The majority of were, were, were uh, with the adults. Now, after the charter in 2002, everything shifted because then all parishes, I, I'm sorry, all dioceses were uh, asked to establish these review boards and the review boards focus just right. on on kids but we've got we've got other problems that that need to be addressed mm -hmm. and they uh, are, are major in my estimation well we're going to end uh, with just one takeaway from each of you and then uh, we will uh, end uh, our session tonight so um, Francesco, would you like to just, in a very pithy way, give us one takeaway that you would hope people would remember? The one takeaway would be that we have to really focus on the ethos of leadership, uh, because if there's going to be a systematic and systemic change, it's going to come with a change in, in the ethos and the culture of leadership. Catherine. Never forget uh, the people who are affected the victims and help us to find better ways for them to tell their stories and to be helped without them suffering even more uh, because they have that courage. Amen. Thank you. Dr. Sperry? Yeah. Uh, bishops and major uh, superiors must take responsibility for supporting root cause analyses and reform efforts that result from them must also support and encourage full reparation efforts for moral injury, because not to do so, uh, to do both of these would be a profound moral failure. Kathleen. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, continued collaboration, and also uh, I hope that we can work on some very practical uh, recommendations as a result of the conversation that we had this evening, so we can bring that back to um, our uh, parishioners at Holy Trinity and elsewhere. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Well, uh, that's one of the end results we're going to share with you via email or the concrete recommendations we see going forward. Summarize that for you from, from our perspective. I can't thank you all enough for coming out on a Sunday evening. Uh, and to really be part of uh, a continuing effort that's been here at Georgetown um, of that collaboration that we hope will, will continue, but most especially for the generosity and time of my fellow colleagues here and uh, partners in this. So please give her a big round of applause to them.